Hi, my name's Hannah Huxford. I'm 48 years old. I'm from Grimsby in the United Kingdom. And my story is about my life living with an undiagnosed ADHD and all the chaos that came with it. When I was 15 years old, um, I was raped by a man and a woman who I knew. I trusted them, but never um, reported the crime, never spoke about it until recent years because I was always made to feel that it was always my fault. And that is how I've always felt most of my life. And somehow I've managed to put a lot of um, trauma behind me, which has left me with post-traumatic stress. When I was about 12 years old, um, I used to help out at a local riding school and befriended a girl there who my family trusted. Moving on to when I was about 15 years old, I remember walking through um, Grimsby Town Centre and bumping into this girl that I knew when I was a young girl at the riding school. But at the time, um, I wanted to be cool and everything else and kept on telling, you know, I've had a boyfriend, I'd lost my virginity and I was this and I'd drink and i smoke and showing off, putting it on this whole bravado. And she just had a baby. Um, she was 18 years old and she just had a baby and the baby was in the pram and innocently she... You know, I thought she was inviting me around for um, the night to her home, you know, to have a, be with the baby and her. Anyway, at the time, um, I stayed the night. I went to um, her home um, with her then uh, boyfriend. What I remember is there was a lot of involved. Now, the craziest thing is because of that night, I've never drunk since from the age of 15. From this very moment, I've never touched a drop to what happened to me that night. They deliberately had calculated and manipulated me um, to get in me. They'd obviously planned the rape. There is no doubt about that. But at the time, as a 15 year old girl, I trusted this girl who I knew from the riding school. But I do believe that I was, everything went black and red. It is like a black and red video that is playing in my mind. Next thing I know, um, they put on a porn video. Now back then, in the early 90s, it was VHS cassettes. I'd never seen a porn film before. And the next thing you know, the girl and the guy were getting very frisky together. I, even though I was, I remember feeling really uncomfortable. And what happened next was not something that I had in one, any shape or form had expected to happen. I can remember taking myself out of the equation and going into the bedroom where the baby was sleeping in the cot. This baby was only a few months old and I thought I'd be safe there. Next thing I know, I must have passed out. I felt this sensation between my legs and it was the girl in between my legs giving me oral sex. But I was paralyzed to do anything and a baby was next to me in that bed. I remember turning to the side and seeing that baby. And the saddest thing is that child would now be 32 years old and they would never know that their mom and dad was raping a 15 year old girl. I remember the next thing I know, a pressure on top of me and the heaviness on my chest and her holding me down, saying the words, you need her. Those words I remember so clearly, you need to fuck her. And I couldn't speak. I could not stop what was happening. I remember him trying to penetrate me while she held me down. And all I can remember is I've got to get out of here. She was holding me down while he was trying to penetrate me. I remember screaming out, you're a devil. And if I'm honest with you right now, I can't remember how it all stopped. And this is what makes me think that I had been I'd been, I had to say, I know I'd, I'd been drinking, but there must have been something for me to have been comatized like that. Somehow I managed to get out of that house. I don't know how, I don't even know. I think I was half dressed and somehow had run across the village where it happened to the safety of where my friends lived. And I knew they would be having a sleepover in a caravan. And somehow I got in there and got inside the caravan and lo and behold, my friends were there, but nobody said anything. And I can remember curling up to my friend at the time and just going to sleep and never wanted to talk about it again.
and I never spoke to anybody about that rape. But all I know is from that day forward, I never drunk a drop of because what happened to me, I had to keep on control. But sometimes it's really difficult to explain to somebody why you don't drink. But that really affected me for the whole of my life. After my rape, I actually became more promiscuous. And I think the reason why I became more promiscuous was my way of dealing with it. It had tarnished me. I felt dirty and tarnished. I basically became more and more sexual because of the rape. I always felt it was always my fault. I come from a good family. Um, I've had a very good upbringing. I've never had any trauma in my upbringing in, as such. I just have always blamed myself. I never told anybody. But what happened was, is then I took it out on myself with control. And the control was I developed really serious eating disorders. So I made a pact with myself. I was never going to drink alcohol again, which I never did. And then I became very controlling with what I ate and then developed severe anorexia by the time I was 17 and became severely bulimic by the time I was 18. I knew the day when I became anorexic, that controlling, I knew from that moment, it started off where I would tell myself I was allowed to have something to eat at three o'clock. And if I didn't eat between that window at three o'clock and quarter past three, then I wouldn't eat again for another 24 hours. It became an addiction, an addict as such, even so probably to someone who is addicted to It affected so many relationships around me. My mum, to be honest with you, was the one that was begging me to get help with my anorexia and I refused to go and get the help, but eventually I did. But it was a vicious circle. The eating disorder was my way of controlling and nobody could stop that, no one. It was a private thing. And it was more than just saying, I want to be thin as well. It was more than that. It was a form of control. And that is how I healed myself. But at the same time, I was also, hurting myself by controlling the way I did with food. And it's taken me nearly five decades to overcome that eating disorder. So going back after my rape, I wanted to get out of my hometown. That was my biggest priority. I had to leave the town that I lived in. And I ended up moving to the West Midlands um, near Birmingham in England. And I went to study photography and when I was at college, um, we house shared um, with a lot of other students. I thought that I was hiding my eating disorder very well. I used to wear baggy clothes, um, even though my bones were sticking through and I could feel the pain. My hair would grow on my face and I was forever cold and always felt like constantly in pain. And she knew straight away, she, she knew she wasn't stupid, but I didn't realize I was affecting her. So we used to share a bedroom together and it got that bad that one of my friends from my hometown came over to stay and they became friends with my housemate. And basically between them, they were discussing my eating disorder. And I couldn't believe that this personal thing that I had my control they were trying to control my control. They sat me down and said they were concerned because I was making my friend ill. And that hurt me so much because I was in pain, trying to get over a trauma. I was using my, my eating disorder to get over a trauma, but at the same time, I was causing pain to a friend of mine without knowing. She then started to develop eating disorders because of my eating disorder. But my eating disorder was about my control to get over a trauma that happened to me at 15. And it was horrific. Got angry with my friend, my housemate, um, because I felt that they were trying to take away my control. And I was angry for them to do that. But at the same time, none of them knew what I'd been through because I was living with this secret, all this pain and all this hurt that happened at me at 15. And it was horrific. And it's only now I can only apologize to my friends. And luckily we, we have reconnected and things are good now. I had a boyfriend at the time. That whole relationship was ruined because of my eating disorder to the point that he cheated on me. And um, again, so the eating disorder got even more worse because I was in pain 
for him cheating on me, but it affected so many people around me without even knowing. I remember I refused to eat a Christmas dinner and my mum cried. She cried because, and she begged me to eat. And I remember picking two peas off that plate and I felt guilty for eating them two peas that again, I had to go into my bedroom and purge or I'd have to go outside and run for about an hour. It was horrific. So I had a nickname, I was called Hanorexia. Oh, look at you, if you turned to the side, you look like a shadow. And then it got even worse because when I started to recover as well from the eating disorder and I put weight on very quickly, again, the comments, what happened to you? You look a mess. I was 17 years old when my anorexia started. I was also 17 years old when I was bulimic and the circle went round and round and round. I was either underweight, overweight, underweight, overweight. I could never find the balance and it took all my life to get to where I am today to say now this is who I am and I'm recovered from an eating disorder, but the pain will always be there. Um, I embrace my weight gain now. I'm the biggest I've ever been in my life, but do you know what? To be where I am right now and say, this is me, this is me, and it doesn't matter. I went to live in Manchester and I was still battling an eating disorder and still battling a trauma of a rape. When I got to Manchester, I got really into the Manchester night scene and scene and club scene and all the rest of it and had a big fascination for the nightlife, the culture and things like that. And at the time I was um, dating a Jamaican guy and he'd gone to prison. He came back out of prison and bearing in mind, I was only about 19 or 20 years old. He came out of prison and he cheated on me and he was the first love of my life. The first love when it happens is heartbreaking anyway, but I was absolutely devastated, heartbroken, broken hearted and I was bored. And how I got into the porn industry was not something that I went out to seek, not in any shape or form, but the way I was, how vulnerable I was, and everything that I'd been through in my life, um, I took things literally. I got myself a job in Manchester as a sales girl um, in a photographic laboratory. And next door, there worked a glamour photographer. And this particular day, I was going to drop some film off next door to the glamour photographer. Never thought anything of it. And when I walked into his studio, I walked in on an actual porn film being made. I was vulnerable and I walked in on this porn film and I'll never forget it to this day. It was like a proper production and the, the makeup artist asked if I'd want a cup of tea and I had a cup of tea and sat and watched a porn film being made and I was just like, all right, this is interesting. This is how vulnerable I was. And the next thing you know, the actor came over to me and was like, oh, who are you? And I'm like, oh, I, I work next door. And then he says to me, oh, uh, would you like to earn this amount of money each month, each week, whatever? And I'm like, yeah, all right then. And he gave me a business card of his then girlfriend and literally said, give her a ring and um, she'll get you some work. That's what I did. And she said, can you come to London? And I said, well, I'm, I, I can come this weekend after work. And I drove to London. I didn't even think about it. I just went in my car took myself down, had no idea who I was going to meet, who these people were. And I went to this place in London and she pulled up in a big fancy car with a roof off and she took me upstairs to this flat, which soon came apparent was a brothel. She stripped me off my clothes. She literally put me into some lingerie and said, right, there's an address. I need you to go to that address. I didn't even have chance to even think. And my brain was just like, oh, oh, okay. Just got told this is what I had to do and knocked on the door of this guy. And this guy opened the door and literally I wanked him off. That's what happened. And he gave me the money. And I remember coming out of that and going back to that flat. What have I just done? All of this was something I never ever seeked out to do, but has affected me for the whole of my life. And I went back to that flat and literally I rung up the lady who uh, who was a madam. And she said, right, tomorrow 
you're going to do your first porn film. In the morning, she came and she picked me up. So I had to have this Eliza HIV test, which they did within half an hour, whatever you paid your money. I think it was like 100 quid or something like that. I didn't even know where I was going. She took me to this location. And the next thing you know, um, she's... Um, She's literally there with a the whole film crew. It was a proper production. I showed my HIV test, whatever, and it turns out the actor that I worked with was the actor that I'd seen in Manchester, and this was the agent's boyfriend. I just made a porn film with all these people around me, and it was all a blur. And again, I did not go out to do it. I was so naive, so vulnerable, and I just was like, yeah, okay, I'll just do that. Did not realize that how vulnerable I was. I went back to my normal job, and then she asked me to go back to London the next week. And I did a live striptease on a TV channel, uh, an X-rated channel here in the UK. And somebody at my workplace where I was a sales agent, back then had a VHS cassette, that's how old it was, recorded me on a VHS cassette and took it in to my then boss. I had a phone call and they said, literally, you are fired. Now this was the green light where my porn career happened. And next thing you know, they published a story about how I was going to be the next big porn star. I spent a year, maybe two years in the in that industry, in the sex industry, making um, hardcore porn, soft porn, worked in Europe, went all over the place, all over the, over the world nearly. And at the same time, then I worked as a high class escort throughout London and did that. It was um, not something that I went out to seek, but got involved. But then once I got into the into that industry, I couldn't get out. But back in the 90s, we didn't have social media. We didn't have what we had now. I never thought of the consequences of what I did and what I was doing at the time, how it would affect me in the future. One particular moment, which was really bad, is back in the 90s, I can't remember what it was, in there was um, a story that was going around that there was a guy from Brixton who was going into the brothels around London and was raping women or women were getting hit, hurt. And um, it was scary times. This one particular time, a guy came to the flat where I did the escorting. I don't know, I got a vibe off him that there was something not quite right with him, but I somehow tried to pacify him, tried to make jokes and make light of it as you do. And he raped me. He was, obviously off his face on there was no doubt about it i somehow managed to get on him eventually off me but did it in such a way like oh it's time up now but effectively it was a rape even though i know i was an escort and he was coming there to be entertained the way how it was was not consented after it happened um he got up and i basically tried to to get the money from him and he sort of like made oh, oh I've left it in the car he basically he went he left and um I remember feeling really disgusted and degraded and dirty but the most hurtful thing about that was how the madam the agent woman who was looking after me how she dealt with it she basically went oh well I've got another person for you to go and see I was just a cash cow i was just a number to her of a transaction there was no humanity to what i experienced and because i was working in the sex industry i thought well i'm to blame there aren't i it's my fault who's going to believe that if i told the police at the time they'll go well you you you're an escort you deserve that that was a really horrible experience to have i knew on this particular set when I got there that they weren't acting, it was real. So again, manipulating me. So again, I went through um, a horrific experience and that's when I knew I had to get out of the porn industry. I'm so grateful for one girl that was put on that particular assignment to Bahrain. We were told that there were people in Bahrain that were 
you go there for about a month that's what we were told and we would earn x amount of money if we went i went to bahrain as a really totally naive girl again i was i went there with this other girl now this girl was older than me and luckily she saved my life she saved my life because she knew straight away when we got there we were in trouble and so we was in bahrain and we get there and literally we were picked up by a guy i don't even know who this guy was we were taken to the outskirts of bahrain and we ended up in this flat which was empty there was no but there was no furniture other than probably a chair and she said hannah we have got to get out of here and i'm like oh it's okay she was like are you for real we have got to get out of bahrain don't you realize we have been sex trafficked over here but this is how naive i was the flights have all been paid for by this guy in bahrain were you owing this guy the money in bahrain luckily they never took our passports off us they wanted our passports and there was a glass screen that was between checking in and whatever luckily we were on the the side where he couldn't get in and he literally was behind the glass screen doing that as if he was going to slice our necks open it was horrific when we got back to the uk the girl that i was with said i'm not i'm not doing this anymore but i didn't i was too far in i was too far into the sex industry so i got out of the sex industry just like the story of pretty woman i met a guy in london when i was escorting for a high class agency there a very well to do guy and he was a regular client of mine and it got to the point that he used to just pay to just talk to me and he literally used to say why is a nice girl like you doing this you are far too nice to be doing this how the hell have you got into this and he basically said to me what can i do to stop you from doing this how can i get you out of it and um we came to an agreement that he would financially support me as long as i took myself out the industry and the agreement was that the moment that i found love or met somebody would be the moment that our transaction between each other would stop this guy didn't want anything from me after that he financially supported me for about 9 months after he got me out of the industry but i was really traumatized out the end after when i got out of the industry and somehow just carried on and moved on with my life so i was in the sex industry from the age of 22 to the age of 24 i was diagnosed with adhd combined moderate to severe um with post traumatic stress and dyslexia at the age of 47 years old the moment that i got my diagnosis it gave me finally the truth and answers to why i behaved the way i did behave or all these experiences that i'd been through and why i behaved and on how i dealt with it and um having my diagnosis gave me my my life back it's given me my life back getting my diagnosis because i now can freely talk openly about everything that happened in my life and go through why did i do what i did but um from um my diagnosis it's given me the opportunity to write my books um now i have used my books as my therapy um so like i say my very first book which is already out um it talks about my life from early childhood all the way to the year 2000 and um, it's a four series book but what it does it's my journal of my life of discovery and when you really look at the how ADHD does affect people it's more than just a naughty child at school um it's more than that and that's why the books are important to get that message out to understand that I am a survivor of a lot of trauma. I've been through a lot, but I'm still here and I can look at myself in the mirror every day and do you know what I say? This is who I am. This is me. It's a liberating feeling to find that freedom and having my diagnosis gave me a new chance in life to find and be the real person that I am, not the person that I thought I was.